Let us pray. We join your creation today and sing your glory. Everything that surrounds us declares who God is with joy and thanksgiving. That's what the psalmist says. Because David also saw as he was outside with his flock. How everything you created brings you glory. The beauty, the perfection, the animals in their splendor. And then you made us to be a part of your kingdom. To, to relate to you, to be your children, and oh, we, we walked away. Thank you that we can be in your presence today because all you have done for us. Thank you that you called us back and did not keep silent. Thank you, Lord, that we can open up your word and even have this confession, this catechism that we are looking at, that help us to find our way as your children. See your word in understanding your will for us. Bless us. We are here in your midst, in your presence. Please, O oh Lord, use the words I need to share, that we may all hear the word and the voice of God today. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you did not or could not attend last week, I encourage you to go and listen to last week's sermon because uh, this sermon and last week's sermon are really sort of bind together. Uh, um, uh, we just had a commercial break, and we are continuing with exactly the same story, because I could not get done last week. But I, um, I'm, I'm not going to end anymore. You know, Luis and I went and we watched Avatar. It's three hours. And I said to her, if they can make a movie for three hours, I can preach for three hours. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so why must I feel guilty to stop within 30 minutes if they can do it for three I'm just kidding. Okay, so long and a short story is I started off last week by sharing with you a document that was printed in the year 19, uh, 16, uh, 1563 in January, and that is the um, Heidelberg Catechism. And if you look at this picture, I reminded you last week, this guy looks worn out, he looks tired, because this is life. Life is very difficult, and the Heidelberg Catechism helps us in a way to discover God's Word, God's truth for us, as we journey through a world that is sometimes quite complicated and quite, quite difficult. And I reminded you last week that every single thing that we find in the Heidelberg Catechism is based on biblical principles. Every single sentence almost has two or three biblical references behind it, and that's why it's well thought through. It's all based on the Bible. It's not standing loose from anything else. The way that the Heidelberg Catechism is uh, prepared or presented is in a question and answer uh, format. So last week we started with question one, and there are actually 52 questions because you're supposed to have a question for every Sunday of the year, for the 52 weeks that we have in a year. Now we will, n I'll see how far we get this year. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through a bit of this, this, this catechism this year. Uh, if it takes me two or three Sundays to get through one question, it's going to be interesting. Um, but question one, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And without repeating then what I said last week, um, this question has to do with what provides for you the purpose and the meaning of your life. Uh, the word comfort has nothing to do with being comfortable. It means what is the thing I turn to, or who do I turn to in my life if I'm alone and I'm afraid and I'm concerned about life and about things that are happen happening with me? And this is the, I think, most universal question that, that most people struggle with. The question about life, the meaning of life, purpose, and then how to deal with loneliness and hardship and, and all the things that find its way into your life. I actually last week had two different people ask me the same question. Why are there so many bad things happening to really good people? Now there's a book that gives the answer. But last week, two different people ask me exactly the same question. Because that's the thing that people struggle with in life. Is why is it that you and I are trying to serve the Lord the best that we can sometimes face all of these difficult obstacles? And this question tries to answer then, in a sense, uh, what, we, what we should find in the Bible. And this is the answer. That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, that's Jesus Christ, 
who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil. That he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life, makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And what I did last week was, I did just the first part of the answer. We spoke about the fact that I belong body and soul in life and in death, not to myself, but then to Jesus Christ. Um, and I spoke at length about the fact that what does it mean to be then owned by Christ and, and to, to follow him in all of those things. So if you did not hear it, go and please listen to this sermon. Today I want to get to that part where he talks about the dominion of the devil, of Satan. So this is our focus point then for today. Freedom from Satan's hold. He has completely freed me from the dominion of, of Satan. Now, I, I do not like to talk about Satan a lot. Um, I do not, do not ever want to give him too much attention because I think what Christ has done for us is way more important than talking about the devil. Uh, there's a whole theolo theology about the Satan, actually. If you go and page the Bible and the role that Satan played in the Old Testament, you can see how his power has actually increased a little bit in the Old Testament to some point. And then at some point his power was then curtailed. He was, he was bound, and, and we'll get to this. Uh, the problem is that uh, people do not want to hear anything about Satan. You know, when I grew up, they, uh, I, I, you know Hot Stuff? You know, the, the cartoon book? You know, the, this guy ran around with his little pitchfork and he would sort of, you know, do all kinds of stuff. And, and, and the world tried to present Satan as this to us, that it's sort of, you know, a cartoon character. That's who, who, Satan, who Satan is. Not really important. Um, there's, this, there's this story of these two boys that came from church, and the pastor really had this very strong sermon about Satan and the devil. And as they walked home, the one boy said to the other one, so what do you believe about Satan and all of this stuff? And, and the one kid said, well, it's the same as Santa Claus and uh, uh, all of these things that we have heard at the end is probably just your dad. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, before I was called to this church, um, somebody that was uh, at quite a high position in our presbytery listened to a sermon that I preached, one of the few I preached in English before I came here because I worked in a different language. And in that sermon, I was preaching from the book of James. I said something about Satan. He said to me, well, when you come to America, don't talk about Satan because we don't believe that stuff anymore. I looked him in the eye and I said to him, I need to disagree with you completely because it's in the Bible. As long as it's in the Bible, I will preach about it. Not the world, not you. No one will stop me from preaching what's in the word of God about Christ, but also about Satan, what the Bible teaches us then about Satan. In the book of Revelation, you will find the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades have been thrown down, or people. The word comrades in Greek can be translated with people has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they do not cling to life, even in the face of death. So, brothers and sisters, if the Bible talks about the dominion of Satan, I ask myself the question, so what does the word dominion then mean for us in this context? If you look at what it means, it means the following, power, authority, jurisdiction, or then control. So when this catechism comes and tells us that what Jesus Christ came to do is to free us from the dominion of Satan, um, the catechism is telling us that in the Bible it tells us that we are under control of Satan. We are actually under the authority of Satan and that we need to be rescued from this grab that Satan has on us that we can be free. There are but two options. 
In life, you have many options. What your eternity is concerned, you have two. Only two. The two options that we have, what our eternity is concerned, is the option if I'm going to be owned by the only holy living God. And that's what I preached about last week. To be owned by God means not that I am now sort of, and I shared with you last week, not put in a cage. To be owned by Him is by accepting through faith the story of salvation. And that's what I explained to someone last week that doesn't understand the gospel. I said the gospel actually means that God comes and God says, I have the way of salvation that I am bringing to you, and all I ask of you is to accept this. And the moment when you accept this, you become part of my family. And being owned means that I'm part of a family, the family of God, which means that God says, and that's the latter part of this answer, God says, therefore then I will and shall and whatever will protect you. Because you are part of mine, you're my family. But then also part of this option, only two. This option where I say, I'm going to accept this offer that Jesus Christ brings me, is to follow Him. You see, this is what owns, in a sense, means. It means that I have given my trust and my direction and my life to someone that I now give the ownership of leading me to my destiny. And whenever you are following a guide at whatever point, you are actually blindly trusting this person that is leading you. We took a few people, and a few of you in the church were there to South Africa many years ago. A group of people, twice from our church. They had no clue where they were going. They knew they were going to South Africa, and they fully trusted us as we, we put them in vans and started driving. No idea where we would end up eventually, because we had to lead them where they were going. That's in a sense what it means. I, I say to God, I trust you completely and blindly I will follow you where you lead me. And in that sense, you give control to him. Because the moment when you start to follow him, you say, okay, now you tell me what to do. So we told the folks before they went, you can buy a bag or you can take a bag that's this big, except one guy brought a bag so big that he could put his wife in it. So, uh, but, but we said, this is how sp- the size of your bag, this is what you should do, this is... This is what you do not do. You don't wander off. You, don't, you understand. You, that's the only way I could keep the group safe. It's by saying, if we are in this part of Johannesburg or Cape Town or whatever, don't wander off because we will not find you. That's what the Lord asks of us. He asks of us to follow His direction. So the will of God that you and I find in the Bible that people find so unacceptable are not there to make our lives miserable but helps us to actually have a life that will reach its destiny that God has in mind for us. The other option for our eternity is to live a life independent of God, to follow my own will. Now, the reason why I'm preaching this sermon is because you sit in church and say, Ferdy, but I don't think I fit into the second category. That is not always true. Remember now that as a Christian, we are on this journey that constantly is being attacked by Satan to try to get us to divert from what we believe. And many times when people are in crisis, they start to question God, and that's when our faith starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and that's where I sometimes say, I'm not going to do what God is asking of me anymore, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm in trouble financially. I need money desperately. I need to Keep food on the table for my, for my family and my children. So stealing is quite an option now, even though I'm a Christian. So stealing becomes an option. And that's the problem. The second option is then when I say, I'm not going to follow God anymore. I'm not going to trust Him with the direction of my life. I'm now going to do my own thing. I'm going to live my life because I think I've got it. I've got it on my end. And I can eventually lead me and myself and my family where I think they should be. The problem is that our declaration of independence does not always mean that I'm free. 
And I said something about this last week also, that people really believe that they are free when they can, can get rid of God. But what they do not know is you are either on God's end or you are on Satan's end. There's a field in front of us. You are either in A team or in B team. You are either part of the darkness or you are part of the light. There's no one on the bleacher. There's no one watching this game that's taking place. There's no referee, no umpire, nothing. You are either on this side or you are on the other side. And the moment when I tell myself, I can be without God, I'm free, I'm actually crossing the line to the other side. And I work, walk into the world of darkness. What does the word of the, what does the, the dominion of the Satan then mean? It means that you and I start to believe this huge lie. This lie that I am okay without God. This lie that I can have control over my own life. This lie that without God things may actually be okay -ish. That's what Eve and Adam believed when Satan tempted them with the apple. It was not an apple, it was the fruit. The word apple just comes from the Latin word malice. Because, no, malum, because the word malice means sin. And, and these two words got confused, so people think it's an apple. It's just the Latin that confused people, but that's just a side point. But there's this big lie that Satan comes and tells us and says, be free without God. B believe, believe that freedom of speech and freedom of everything is the thing that will set you free in this world. Be on your own. You'll be okay. We know that's not true. The problem with Satan is that Satan is out to destroy everything that is good. And the place that he focuses on the most, and I will have a slide about this a moment later, is destroying relationships and the core of a family. If Satan can get people to fall apart within a family, then he's starting to win his battle to destroy what God has made good. Satan comes and he puts traps in front of us. You see, Satan could not come and he could give Ad, uh, Eve the apple and force her to eat it. He could only present it. That's interesting. Satan cannot you make you or me to sin. You know, there's the story of, of this pastor's wife that, that had to go to town, and, and she, uh, she came back, and she bought an extremely expensive dress. And, 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 and her husband said, we can't afford this dress. Why did you buy this dress? She said, well, I was walking down the street, and I saw this beautiful dress, and, and I went inside, and I put it on, and Satan appeared and tempted me to buy this dress. And he said, but why didn't you use that verse? Satan, get away from behind me. She said, yeah, I did. And then he said to me, it looks even better from behind. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, yeah. The Satan will put traps in front of us. So um, to convince us to do not the right thing in many different ways. Because temptations are these traps. And what are temptations? Temptations are those small things that God, that Satan brings to, to ignore what God's will is for us. And eventually when we start to fall into these small traps, we slowly but surely start to lose control over our lives. Do you, do you know when, when, when you fall, and that's what James writes in his letter, what's the time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What James, James oh, but Avatar, three hours, I can go. So what James writes in his letter is he says, you know, temptation is, is like the small thing that starts with an idea. You know, you, you see something and, and you think, oh, that's not too bad. And, and then you go for this thing that's a reality that was started with an idea. And the moment when you go for this thing that's a reality, then suddenly you find that you now need to lie about this thing that's part of your life. There's almost no sin that you do not need to lie about. Always need to lie about sin, isn't it? Because you are too embarrassed to actually tell others what you are doing. So sin always brings lies. And that's what Satan did. He lied to Eve and Adam when he was in paradise because that is the thing that Satan used the best. The lie of this world to tell you and me you can be okay without God. The lie that I can do this and I can get away with it, but then I need to start, start to lie about it also in my life. So it's this huge lie that's slowly but surely taking over my life. And as it takes my life over, I actually are leaving, losing the control that God wants me to have. 
You know, in Ephesians, Paul says, you were dead to the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. Interesting that he says dead. Because that's what Satan does. That's what the dominion of Satan does. It takes away life. You were dead because of the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the rule of power of the air, the spirit that's now at work among those who are disobedient. Heidi. Heidi. We are very involved with the Haitian church here in Orlando. Some of you know, some maybe do not know, but I've been part of the Haitian church and the, and the ministry, you guys, in a sense, through your contribution for probably more than 12 years. I've preached at the, at the Haitian church a few times. Um, we support them financially, and those other guys that we normally give every year turkeys to, and uh, if I told you a few years ago, the pastor called me, and I said, man, everything is breaking, and he came and he brought us a check from their congregation because he said it sounded like we needed help. And I said, it's, it, we, we, we're okay. But. So we had this conversation about what's going on in Haiti. So I can say this because that's what the pastor told me. It's not me. I didn't Google this. He said to me, Ferdy, we talked about everything that's happening there. He said, you know, we were the first country that were completely free as slaves. We were slaves and we were given our freedom. He said that was the biggest joyous thing that could happen in Haiti. But the leaders of our country decided when the nation was formed to bring sacrifices to the voodoo gods. They officially brought sacrifices to the voodoo gods. And this is what he told me. He said because they wanted to break completely free of everything that was Christian and Western and whatever, they said, we are going to go back to our old African roots. I'm from Africa. I can tell you there's nothing as bad as some of these old African religions. They are soaked in the, in, in the world of Satan himself. It's the most, let me not go there. I, I, I can tell you stories that will make your hair stand up straight. So they decided to go to some of these old African religions that is the basis of the voodoo religion that eventually found its way into Haiti. He said to me, Pastor Ferdy, do you know why our country, my country is doing so bad? They thought they're going to buy their freedom by selling their soul to Satan himself. At this point, Haiti is run by gangs. You can't go down the street. You can't buy food. It's gangs is running the whole country. It's a it's, it's a total disaster what is happening in that poor country. And the people in that country are the victims of Satan's rule. Because isn't that what Satan does? Satan wants to destroy lives. And if you want a physical example, look at what happened in Haiti. And every time when I speak to him, I speak to him once a week. He always calls me, I call him, and he asks me, how's your family? And I ask him, how's your family? Because he still has family in Haiti. And I said to him the other day, Pastor Mark, are you going to visit your family? He said, I can't go. They will, the moment when I land there, they will get me. And they will keep me and they will try to ransom me off to whatever. He said, I will not survive a day at this point there. Why? His answer every time, Satan himself. People have lost completely con complete control because they've given it away. What is biblical freedom? The choice to listen to God and live under His authority. It is for the freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So when this Heidelberg Catechism tells us that, that I'm owned by God and that He sets me free from the dominion of Satan, what does it mean? It means that by Christ and through what Christ came to do for me, I can actually turn away from this grasp that Satan has on me, and I can really break free of this, and I can live the life that God wants me to have. The Bible tells me nobody will be tempted beyond what you can handle. I can never say that Satan really made this decision for me. It's me making the decision. It's not Satan. It is me. Satan can't capture me. Satan can't hijack me. Satan can't put me in the trunk of a car and take me somewhere where I do not want to be. But what Satan can do is Satan can stand in front of me and say, I always want to ride with you, but let me be the driver. 
Let me be the driver. And I'll take you where I think we should go. And the moment when I start to trust Him, I will lose control of the joy and the life that God really wants me to have. And this is my concern for the world that we now live in. We live in a world where people think, okay, there are these Christians, and they are on this side, and then all the other people are gray. They are in the gray area, and then, oh, you've got those guys that are atheists, and you maybe have those that are Satanists, and they are now on the dark side. That's where they are. But all the other people here in the gray area are fine. That's nonsense. You are either under control of the Holy Spirit, because you've turned towards God and asked Him to give you guidance, and you follow His guidance through His Word. Or you're actually part of the dominion of Satan. And you believe you are free, because you can do whatever you want, but what you do not know is you slowly but surely will lose your freedom. Because that's what Satan does. Satan eventually takes away the joy and the meaningful and the beauty that they should be in relationships and in your life, and he destroys it. And then he has won. He has conquered a little bit. I, I need to end now, but I'm not closely done with my sermon. <laughs> Protection, that he protects me so, that, so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head indeed. See, this is what the catechism then leads us to. The catechism says, if I give my life to Christ, who paid for me by dying on the cross, that I can be now a child of God. It does not only makes me a child of God, it also helps me to get away from this cling that Satan has on me, and I can't, can't start to relax a little bit. I can live my life because I know that the living Lord has given me His guidance and His word, and He will be there to protect me and guide me. Because that's what God wants to do, protect us from ourselves first, from the world outside that wants to destroy what is good, and then from Satan that will constantly try to drag us as far away from God as possible. But it's not this kind of protection with bubble wrap. It's a protection that actually means, and this is here at the end, where my salvation purpose will be served. And that bring, brings in a brand new dimension of protection, God's will, and God's purpose. I'm going to end here. So I will now, it's going to take me three weeks to get to one answer. It's terrible. I apologize. Um, but we are going to continue next week with this. And then this this first question acts has actual, actually a B part that I have not even shown to you, and I will try to get done with it then next week. But to end then today, two options for eternity, many for life, either with God, without God, but under the control of the world of Satan himself. What a scary thought to be under the dominion of the dark side. And therefore, I'm always so surprised that people do not want to follow Christ. What do you lose if you believe in Jesus? What do you believe? What do you lose? I said to a friend of mine who doesn't believe, what will you lose to believe in Jesus? Except winning. Winning. You can go to bed and not be afraid. You can look at death and not be afraid because that's part of the answer that in life and death my comfort lies in Jesus. I am not afraid of dying because the only holy living God has me. What do you lose? Nothing. But you gain. Oh, you gain so much in Christ who came to tell us there's life with me. Amen.